Web Systems Lesson 3 The Web and Security Part 4 Availability and Risks The final security service we'll look at is availability. Availability is ensuring authorised users can access their website or access your information or do some computing when you need it. And this means that your systems need to survive failures and the solution to that is to have what we call standby mechanisms. I'll talk about hot and cold in a moment. And most importantly have backups, copies of all your work. And of course to ensure that your systems resist attack. For example, by putting in a firewall to protect your network, your internal network from the outside. Put in a content distribution network which protects against a distributed denial of service. A classic example of a content distribution network is where you have multiple servers all over the world and they display your content. For example, Amazon Web Services do this. And of course you need to install anti-malware. In other words, your antivirus, your keylog checkers, your system security scanners. So let's look at each one of these features one at a time. So let's look at how we can make our system survive failures. It's really essential to have good design and good operations. I cannot help but emphasize that. A system's got to be built from the start to be resilient and well managed. One of the key things you can do is to have what we call standby mechanisms. In other words, we have a system that is redundant. And the solution to that is to have more than one server. For example, you might have a main server and a backup server. You might have more than one data center. UTS, in fact, has a data center in the tower and at Macquarie Park. And they have more than one, con one network connection. So if one network connection is down, the other connections are available. UTS happens to be the hub of the New South Wales Regional Network for RNET, which is the university's networks. So obviously we've got more than one connection coming into the UTS campus. So let me explain what I meant by hot and cold standby. A hot standby is a system that is actually online right now and you keep it in synchronization. You may be copying the disks, copying the files, dynamically and in real time. This is also very useful because when you are extremely busy, for example, when there's discount sales or the Olympics, you can actually swap services within minutes or even seconds. And sometimes you can have both servers working to handle the workload. A cold standby is very different. It's a system that you have that you can start quickly, but this is measured in hours hopefully minutes, but typically hours, at the worst case, days or weeks. The idea is you have a backup, which you update the system every day, and the system is actually turned off. When you need it, you turn it on. I suppose it's like having a home machine and a laptop machine. You copy the files using something like Dropbox or OneDrive, and you've got a system that is redundant, and you can use both or either. And last but not least, you must keep backups. Different types of backups you can keep is simple file dumps, a snapshot of everything on your system, or you can do incremental backups. What changed since yesterday? What changed since the day before yesterday? What changed last week? What changed last month? What changed last year? Downside to using incremental backups where you have small backups is it can actually take a while to rebuild a system if you have a problem that was from a few days ago. Another good practice is to have a firewall. And this is at the perimeter of your network. So people from the outside coming in would go through your firewall to get to your servers. Most companies create what's known as a demilitarized zone, DMZ, for their public or external facing servers. It's very rare that you actually access your inside network, but sometimes you do. For example, the UTS virtual private network comes through here and goes straight into our internal systems. 
Other good practices are to use redundancy. I've mentioned this before, use multiple networks from different ISPs. Here we are, different connections. This protects against a special form of attack called a distributed denial of service, sometimes called botnets, which attack your server simultaneously from hundreds, if not thousands or tens of thousands of remotely controlled servers, which are actually desktops in most cases. You can do this by using some very specialized routing switches, very high and very expensive systems, or make use of a thing called a content delivery network. I mentioned before Amazon Web Services, but there are plenty more like Akamai or Cloudflare or even Azure Content uh, Delivery Network or Google Cloud. Google it, you'll find some lots of interesting choices out there. And of course, one way to resist attacks is to vaccinate by installing anti-malware software. For example, Windows 10 has a built-in antivirus called Microsoft Defender. Um, monitor the system by security scanning systems where you actually run programs that watch out for malware type attacks. Um, train your staff. A classic example is train them against things like social engineering. So if I call up and say, please give me your password, don't. Risk assessment. Why do we care about security and why bother? It all depends on your needs. For example, do you need to protect UTS EDUAU? Well, I don't know if you might have heard that some of the public websites of the university have been attacked. Uh, lols rules or something like that. Bad news. Or well, here's an example. There was a crash in Florida quite a few years ago, 1997. Somebody hacked it and they changed the front page of AirTrans to say, uh, ValueJet, sorry, changed its name to AirTrans and um, we killed a few people. Big deal. Bad reputational damage. Didn't cost them any money, but it cost them reputations instead. So we need to always balance our needs with what we actual costs are. So, in so our security should match what that risk assessment is. We need to be aware whether it's internal or external. Classic case, internal hacks are people who steal money from you. Bank employees is a good example. Or external threats. There's cyber warfare happening now. Vandalism occurs. It could be politically motivated. It could be industrial espionage. It happens a lot. It could be simple theft, and that's a classic. So if you have a chance to, I'd like you to think about where you need to go with security. If, for example, it's so hard to access a system, people will bypass security. If you ever go to an office, look under a keyboard. You might find a password. You might find a post pad attached to a screen with a really complicated password rule. So people wrote it down because they can't remember it. What happens there? Consider your users. And I'd like you to have a little exercise if you could. Just think about it. Maybe a post on the discussion board. Have you spotted any security risks or flaws at UTS? But be very careful. Make sure you don't violate any rules. Okay? We don't want my students caught and kicked out of the university for violating security. It's really important. It's a business issue as well as a technology issue. I shouldn't say not, but in, as well as a technology issue. We need to look at all these issues, but for this subject, it's not a big focus, but we need to be very aware of it. So we have to do it cleanly and carefully. If you want to do any further study, fundamental security is another one to look at, as well as, as, well as the follow-on subject, 48730, network security.